for this version of Grace Community Church Online. Hi, I'm Pastor David Graham, Grace Community Church. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing upon our time today, Father. Teach us, encourage us, strengthen us, give us something to think about, something to pray about, and something to warm our hearts, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now for announcements, we have a healing service uh, Sunday, depending on when you're watching this, at 3 p.m. And uh, I'd like you to consider bringing anyone who you know who needs healing prayer. God is in the miracle business. Jesus healed all that came to him. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, this is summertime. Uh, this week, Francis will be on vacation this coming week from July 5th for that week. And then Jan will be taking some vacation time later in July, and I'll be hanging in here. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll manage the office. We have people to cover everything. So uh, the Lord is helping us in every way that we know how. So thank you. Please join me in singing, I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's blissful shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Shadows of this life have gone, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away in the morning when I die Hallelujah, by and by I'll fly away I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Please join me in singing, My Lord, What a Morning. My Lord, what a morning, my Lord, what a morning, oh my Lord, what a morning, when the stars begin to fall. You'll hear the trumpets sound to wake all nations underground. 
Look into my God's right hand when the stars begin to fall. My Lord, what a morning! My Lord, what a morning! Oh, my Lord, what a morning! When the stars begin to fall, you'll hear the sinner moan to wake all nations underground. Look into my Lord's right hand when the stars begin to fall. My Lord, what a morning! My Lord, what a morning! Oh, my Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall. You'll hear the Christians shout. To wake up nations underground, look into my Lord's right hand when the stars begin to fall. My Lord, what a morning! My Lord, what a morning! Oh, my Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall. And now, let's do our prayer request. Uh, family of Sharon Wazorek. We laid her to rest this past Friday. And uh, would you pray for her daughter, Nancy, and her husband, Bill? Pray for those who need physical help. Carl Murphy Framke is still recovering, getting stronger every time, every week, uh, able to get up out of the wheelchair and come and teach class and come to church every Sunday. He's making a, a yeoman's effort to uh, be active at Grace Community. So we really appreciate that. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Pray for comfort for those who need it, healing for those who need it, Lord. We lift up those whose names we've mentioned, Lord. We ask for your blessing in their lives, in Jesus' name. And now we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Let's begin. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Look at 
down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art when christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul Now, our scripture reading from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. How wise and prudent are the people of this great nation. For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on him? And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as this body of instructions that I am giving you today? Now, that's a passage of the Lord speaking to his people when he's about ready to give them the Ten Commandments and other instructions. And today, we're, our sermon is a Fourth of July remembrance of the birthday of America, the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. So we are reading now from uh, Matthew chapter uh, 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world. Like a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Amen.
us over into camp the ground. And now for our message. Deserving America. Deserving America. Our nation's birthday will be celebrated uh, uh, if, if you're lit, watching this on Sunday, it will be tomorrow on Monday, July 4th. America was born approximately 246 years ago, by which some measures seems to be a long time ago, but by other measures, it's not very long at all. Men of character, grounded in their belief in God, came together to create a new country, which we call the United States of America. And we talk about the past, but there never was anything like the past. Nobody lived in the past, if you stop to think about it. Jefferson, Adams, Washington, they didn't walk around saying, isn't this fascinating, living in the past? They lived in the present just as we do. The difference was it was their present, not ours. Nor is there any such creature as a self-made man or woman we love that expression, we Americans, but everyone who ever lived has been affected, changed, shaped, helped, or hindered by other people. The laws we live by, the freedoms we enjoy, the institutions we take for granted are all the work of other people who went before us. And to be indifferent to that isn't just to be ignorant, it's to be rude. Ingratitude is a particular failing when it comes to the understanding of our own history. How can we not want to know about the people who have made it possible for us to live as we live, to have the freedoms we have, to be citizens of this greatest country of all time? It's not just a birthright. It's something that others struggled for, strived for, often suffered for, were defeated and even died for, for us, the next generations. Now, those who wrote the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia that fateful summer of 1776 were not superhuman by any means. Every single one of them had flaws, his failings, his weaknesses. Some of them were disliked by others of them. Every single one of them did things in his life he regretted. But the fact that they could rise to the occasion as they did, these imperfect human beings, and do what they did is also, of course, a testimony to their own humanity. We are not just known by our failings, our weaknesses, but on our sins. We are also known by being capable of rising to whatever task God puts before us, exhibiting not just a sense of direction, but strength and dependence upon the Almighty. The Greeks said that character is destiny. Maybe they were right. You look at the great paintings by John Trumbull or Charles Wilson Peale or Copley or Gilbert Stewart, those remarkable people who were present at the creation of our nation, the founders we call them. Those aren't just likenesses they painted. They are delineations of character and were intended to be. And we need to understand that they knew that the nation they had created was no more perfect than they are. And that has been to our advantage. It has been good for us that it wasn't just all handed to us in perfect condition, all ready to run in perpetuity, that it needed to be worked at and improved and made to work better. And it still does. And we're not through yet. Now, there's this wonderful incident that took place at the Cambria Iron Company in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in the 19th century, when they were building the very first Bessemer steel machinery, adapted from what had been seen of the Bessemer process in Britain. There was a, a German engineer named John Fritz, and after working for months to get this machinery finished, he came into the plant one morning and he said, all right, boys, let's start her up and see why she doesn't work. That's very American. We will find out what's not working right and we will fix it and maybe then it will work right. That's been our star. That's what we do. Keep in mind that when we were founded by those people in the late 18th century, none of them had any prior experience in revolutions or nation making. They were, as we would say, winging it. And they were idealistic and they were young. We see their faces in the old paintings done later in their lives are looking at us from the money in our wallets and we see the awkward teeth and the powdered hair and we think of them as some kind of elder statesman. But think about this. George Washington, when he took command of the Continental Army at Cambridge in 1775, 
He was 43 years old, and he was the oldest of them. Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. John Adams was 40. Benjamin Rust, one of the most interesting of them all, and one of the founders of the anti-slavery movement in Philadelphia, was 30 years old when he signed the Declaration. They were young people. They were feeling their way, improvising, trying to figure out what would work. They had no money, no navy, no real army. There wasn't a bank in the entire country. There wasn't but one bridge between New York and Boston. It was a little country of about 2,500,000 people, and 500,000 of those were held in slavery. It was just a little fringe settlement on the east coast of what we now call America. And what a story. What a noble beginning. And think about this. Almost no nation in the world knows when they were born. We know exactly when we began and why we began and who did it. 47 men signed the Declaration of Independence, and it wasn't signed on July 4th. They didn't even start to sign it until August 2nd, and only a part of the Congress was there present. They kept coming back in the months that followed from their different states to take turns signing the document. These young men were making history, and we can never forget them. The momentous step wasn't a paper being handed down by a king or a czar. It was a decision of a Congress acting freely as free men, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, never before attempted in the annals of history, profound in its ideas, unprecedented in its scope, and hopefully enduring until the end of time. Certainly they were guided by a higher power. Their collective decision led directly to war with Great Britain. These were men of character and strong belief in God. There's a line in one of the letters written by John Adams where he's telling his wife Abigail at home, we can't guarantee success in the war, but we can do something better. We can deserve it. We can deserve it. Think how different that is from the attitude today when all that seems to matter is success, being number one, getting ahead, getting to the top. However you betray or gouge or claw or do whatever awful thing is immaterial as long as you get to the top. That line in the Adams letter is saying that no matter how the war turns out, it is in the hands of God. We can't control that, but we can control how we behave. We can deserve success. You can't understand why honor was so important to them and why they were truly ready to put their lives their fortunes, even their sacred honor on the line, unless you understand their character. The words they spoke and wrote were not just words. They were lines in the sand. These men were truly salt and light in their world. And we in the 21st century are called to be the same. As John Stott has written, the notion is not that the world is tasteless and that Christians can make it less insipid, but that it's putrefying. It cannot stop itself from going bad. Only salt introduced from outside can do this. The church is set in the world as salt to at rest or at least to hinder the process of social decay. God intends the most powerful of all restraints within sinful society to be his own redeemed, regenerate, and righteous people. So it's our turn. We must be the people of character in our time if we are to preserve what our founders passed down to us. We must retain our saltness. The influence of us Christians in and on our culture depends upon us being distinct, not identical with the godless thinking we encounter. Even further, this difference must be applied to what is in fact decaying. Unless the salt penetrates the culture, the decay cannot be arrested. Are you up to it? Am I up to it? We'll see. The Revolutionary War was the darkest time we've ever been through. 1776, the year we so consistently and rightly celebrate every year, was one of the dark of times, if not the darkest time in the history of this country. Some of you here remember the first months of War of 1942 after Pearl Harbor when German submarines were sinking our oil tankers right off the coast of Florida and New Jersey in sight of the beaches, and there wasn't a thing we could do about it. Our recruits were drilling with wooden rifles. We had no air force, 
Half of our Navy had been destroyed at Pearl Harbor, and there was nothing to say or guarantee that the Nazi war machine could be defeated. Nothing. And who was to know? I like to think of what Churchill said when he crossed the Atlantic after Pearl Harbor and gave a magnificent speech. He said, we haven't journeyed this far because we're made of sugar candy. I hope he was right. Yes, salt, not sugar candy. We must not lose our saltiness. When we pray for and participate in the freedoms we have been given, when our lives reflect the righteousness, joy, and peace of God's kingdom on a consistent basis, then we might be said to have deserved our blessings. We truly are the salt of the earth. So, happy birthday, America. Help us to deserve by our lives, our light shining brightly, and our saltiness to deserve the freedoms we enjoy. Would you pray with me for a moment? Close your eyes, please. Sovereign Lord, fill us with hope and wisdom as we try to be salt and light in our time. May we stand for truth and righteousness in a world growing ever darker and confused. May we grow into godly men and women of character standing against the tides that threaten to sweep us away. If you, Lord, are for us, who can be against us? Thank you, Father. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me.